For those of you that haven't heard of the five different love languages, they are essentially concepts describing how you feel loved and how you show others love. The five different love languages are quality time, words of affirmation, physical touch, receiving gifts, and acts of service. The way that I feel the most loved is through words of affirmation, and I show others love through quality time. What I've recently learned is that your five different love languages can affect every aspect of your life. I've also recently learned your community is really important to help you move forward. My freshman year of college, I did the things that you're supposed to do when you're a freshman. I would go to the gym, I'd eat a whole pizza in one sitting, and I'd cry into my pint of Ben & Jerry's ice cream during my finals week to alleviate my stress. But slowly, I realized that I was gaining weight, and it wasn't just the freshman 15. I felt like I needed to pass out at times, especially during my insanely heavy periods. I know, that's kind of gross. So I went to, oh, so I went and I felt my stomach and you know, it wasn't soft and squishy like it's supposed to be when you've got a little bit of flub, but it was large and it was rock solid. I knew immediately that something was wrong. A quick WebMD search told me I had a hernia. I thought to myself, that's no big deal. It'd be a quick in and out procedure. I'll be back on my feet in no time. I wish I had a hernia. Following a hectic trip to my primary care physician and a CT scan, I was soon in the office of my gynecologist being told that I had a large fibroid mass on my uterus. Not in my uterus, but on. It was about the size of a grapefruit or small cantaloupe. I was also told that fibroid masses are benign, meaning not cancerous, and pretty common as 20% of women will have them. Your uterus is seven centimeters if you've never had a child. My tumor itself was 12 centimeters. I was told that something was wrong. You see, I didn't fit the mold. Fibroid masses are common if you fell into one of these three categories. You're menopausal, you're considered obese, and for reasons that we don't understand, you're African American. Well, I'm white, so that was a shocker, and I'm 18, well, I was 18 then, now I'm 19. And I do go to the gym occasionally, contrary to popular belief. So I was nervous, and I didn't understand why this was happening to me. So I did the only thing reasonably possible when you have someone of a background in science. I began literature searching. I peered over research articles and scientific publications and every kind of case study in the NIH database, telling me why this was happening, but nothing made sense. Quickly, I was told at my first um, ultrasound that this was weird. And I was told that having children might be more complicated for me um, if or when I do have children because my uterus was undergoing trauma that wasn't child related. I was told that if or when I do decide to have children of my own, I would have to have a C-section because again, my uterus was undergoing trauma that wasn't a child. This was okay with me though because I knew that you know, I still had the opportunity to bear my own children. So I was relieved to hear that it would soon be over. I would have surgery, the mass would be gone, and I was expecting to wake up feeling like a large mass had been removed from my body, like a brand new person. I didn't tell very many people that I was having surgery, quite frankly, because I didn't think enough people cared about me to know. And I really just didn't want to be judged for it. I didn't want people to you know, look at me differently and think, oh, that's the girl with the tumor, because soon it would be over. On June 16, I had surgery. I was nervous going in, even though I had the few people that I had told rooting for me. In fact, before the operation, a nurse poked her head in just because her son went to the high school that I graduated from. She made sure that I was okay. She said, I'll go Firebirds and left. It was incredibly comforting. Also, of course, my parents were there for me every step of the way, and my boyfriend, Ben, who had to have some very uncomfortable conversations with me about my uterus and tumors and the future, and whether or not that could include children and what that might look like. So I went into surgery, you know, trying to be funny, as I typically am, and I was really just trying to hype up these residents, right? And I said, you'll never see anything like this again. It's so cool. I don't think I wanted to mean those words. And then I came out of surgery two hours later. I felt groggy and heavy 
and large. But I knew that I could be okay so long as Tabitha, my tumor, was outside of my body. <laughs> but she wasn't. My parents and boyfriend joined me in the post-op area and explained to me why my Tabitha was still inside of my body and not in a biohazard container like she should have been. They told me that she was too vascularized and she wasn't encapsulated. Translation, she had a lot of blood vessels, and if they tried to cut into them, then that could put me at risk for needing a blood transfusion, or I could potentially lose my uterus. That wasn't the goal. In terms of being encapsulated, the surgery was supposed to be some sort of dissection where they would scoop her out and all would be well. But she blended in, and there was no good place to cut. This led to a series of unfortunate events. Not only was coming out of surgery the most painful thing I've ever endured, but now I had to deal with the fact that my uterus wasn't working like it was supposed to. And I was 18, you know, I thought, you know, I had a couple more years with my uterus, that kind of thing. So, as I was crying, being carted up to my hospital room, I was awaited by some of the best friends that I could ask for. One of them even brought me ice cream from Graders, but unfortunately it had melted because the operation took a little bit longer than we had anticipated. I laughed, but then I cried. And then I fell asleep. <clears throat> When I woke up, my boyfriend's parents came by to my hospital room and they brought me flowers. It was so remarkable and I felt so loved and cared about that I actually cried. I remember I didn't want to talk about the situation at hand, and I don't remember much because I was on quite a few pain medications, but all I can remember is talking about cats. The next day, I, was, I went home from the hospital and I was immediately visited by a whole bunch of friends. Some brought snacks and books, and others brought gossip, but every single one was so ready to chat about me and my uterus and what my reproductive future might look like. The, one of the highlights of this week, and this one's kind of embarrassing, was my best friend Brenna bringing me this green smoothie ingredient bag. We nicknamed this my poop juice because I was so constipated from all the pain medication. Obviously, I needed some sort, I needed some sort of remedy. You know what it helped. It was exciting. <clears throat> Throughout this week, I also began planning on you know, what this whole uterus thing was going to look like and how this next situation was going to go. I would, when I couldn't sleep, I'd look into banking my eggs just in case and then texting Ben furiously at three in the morning about how oh, everything's gonna be okay and everything's gonna be fine, just trying to convince myself. Soon I was at a, my post-op appointment with my gynecologist and she explained to me what had happened. We decided that me being put on Lupron was the next best option. <clears throat> Lupron is a medication that would essentially put me through medical menopause. Yeah, I thought I had 30 more years before the whole hot flashes thing began, but I was wrong. <laughs> the thought was that Tabitha was feeding off of my hormones and so ridding my body of hormones was probably a good option. I knew that Lupron had some wild side effects, including losing some bone density, and I didn't want bone damage done in my young adulthood, so that, combined with the fact that this story was not over, really brought on the waterworks. After I collected myself, I wound up in Whole Foods with my parents. My mom asked me what I thought of the verdict of being put on Lupron, and that was the same moment that I made eye contact with the bananas. And then I began to cry. So there I was, sobbing in the produce section of Whole Foods. Yeah. <clears throat> three weeks later, I had my first Lupron injection. It was also within this, these three weeks that I began talking about Tabitha openly to anyone that would listen. I realized that I needed to rely on my community for my support because you know, staying closed off and quiet about my situation was making me feel isolated and alone. Quickly, I learned that I needed people and that I cope in a very specific way, you know, by joking, obviously, and you know, by talking to people about my situation. I realized that I could be so like only be so strong on my own. I was settled into my bouts of hot flashes and all things menopause by the time school started up again. It was also around this time that I found out that the, my insurance company did not approve uh, the next procedure needed to essentially get rid of Tabitha. The procedure was FDA approved in 2012, but since not enough people were having this procedure done because insurance companies weren't covering it, insurance companies did not think that this procedure was beneficial. 
I check the scientific literature. I disagree with their denial, but that's not the point. I appealed and I appealed and I appealed, but to no luck. Pretty soon, I thought, I don't know what else to do. I'll just start a crowdfunding campaign. I didn't think it would work, but to some degree, it did. Soon enough, my story was everywhere, and I was, um, and so many people were contacting me. Some that I hadn't spoken to in years, or had met once, or were parents of even some of my friends. They were all reaching out to let me know that they were thinking of me. It was remarkable. It was also around this time that one of my good friends made up wristbands that said, terminate Tabitha the tumor, so that way college students could donate to the cause in a way that wouldn't break the bank. It was a little bit embarrassing for me to see this on everyone, not because it wasn't heartwarming, but because I didn't realize that people actually cared about me. I know, what a concept. <laughs> Eight months ago, I cried in a Whole Foods. And now, here I am telling this story to you. I wish I had answers for you, and I wish there were some sort of conclusion to this story, but there's not. I wish I could add some sort of epilogue about how things are now, but I can't. What I can tell you is that I've learned that your community can really affect how you move forward. This story is constantly evolving, kind of like us. And the way that we communicate to each other affects how we view ourselves and how we view our struggles. It seems like every single day, a new chapter is added to the story. The turmoil of Tabitha the tumor. Thank you.